The People of Sparks, sequel to The City of Ember, written by Jeannie Duprow. The Second Town Meeting The three town leaders called a meeting after these unpleasant incidents, the tomato throwing and the graffiti on the plaza and the hotel wall. They met in the tower room of the town hall to talk. This is unfortunate, Mary said. I'm afraid these spiteful deeds will cause bad feelings to get worse on both sides. Wilmer nodded. Feelings are already bad, he said. These cave people, said Ben, are not as civilized as we are. People who will destroy two whole crates of tomatoes might do anything. We don't know for sure that one of them did it, Mary said. Come on now, Mary, said Ben. I think it's safe to assume. And what about the people who wrote, go back to your cave on the hotel walls, said Mary. The problem is, said Ben, we don't know who did that. But I must say, I think they were expressing an understandable frustration. These cave people have adversely impacted our way of life. The food we give them comes out of the mouth of our own people. We do have a bit of surplus in the storehouse, said Mary. But why should we use it for them? It's our protection against hard times. Ben smoothed his beard and went on. I have a rule to suggest, he said. I think it would be best if the cave people didn't eat in the homes of our families anymore. I think it's too hard in our families to have strangers eating with them every day. It would be better if the family simply hand them their food parcels when they arrive. They can eat somewhere else. Where? asked Mary. Ben waved a hand in the direction of the river. On the river bank, he said, or at the edge of a field, or on the road. I really don't care where they eat, he said, as long as they don't intrude on our households. Quite a few people have complained of the inconvenience, said Wilmer. The Parton family seems most unhappy. That's because they had that evil boy, said Ben, the one who threw the tomatoes. We don't know that he's the one who threw them, said Mary. We are as sure as we need to be, said Ben. So they voted. Should they make that a rule? Mary voted no. Ben voted yes. Wilmer hesitated for several seconds, his eyes darting between Mary and Ben. Finally, he voted yes. I suppose this will make things better, said Wilmer. I'm sure it will, said Ben. We need to make it clear that this town belongs to us. This is our place, and these people are only here because of our generosity. I think we have made it clear, said Mary. We went to all the trouble to make a flag to put up on the town hall. No doubt that will help, said Ben. Still, we must consistently reinforce the message. If they don't behave themselves, they can't expect to stay here even as long as six months. They've just begun to get used to things, said Mary. They're not ready to leave. That, said Ben, is not our problem. Chapter 18 Casper's Quest. On the last night of their journey to the city, the travelers stayed in a real house. It was roofless, but most of the walls still stood, providing shelter from the wind that blew strongly off the water. There was no furniture in the house, of course. They sat on the bare floor. Casper was excited that night. He talked so much that he almost forgot to eat. His third traveler's cake sat on his knee getting cold. At one point, he turned to face Lena. Now listen, he said, I'm going to tell you something so you understand the importance of what we're doing. He paused. Then he spoke in a low, vibrating voice. I happen to know, he said, that there is a treasure in the city. There is, said Lena. How do you know? Old rhymes and songs speak of it, said Casper. The trouble is, said Maddie, those old rhymes and songs don't make sense anymore, if they ever did. They make sense to me, Casper said, but that's because I've studied them carefully and have found out their deeper meaning. What do the old rhymes say? Lena asked. Various things, said Casper, depending on what version you hear. But they're always about a treasure in an ancient city. He looked into the air and sang tunelessly. There's buried treasure in an ancient city. Remember, remember, from times of old. One of them starts like that. Why hasn't anyone searched for the treasure before? asked Lena. I'm sure many people have, Casper said, but no one has found it. How do you know? Lena asked. 
because obviously if someone had, we would have heard about it. Lena thought about this. She saw some holes in Casper's logic. Someone could have found the treasure, taken it away, and never said a word. Another problem, said Maddie, is that these rumors never say what city the treasure is in. It could be some city a thousand miles away. Casper gave an exasperated sigh and set down his cup of water. He raised two fingers and pointed them at Maddie. Listen, he said, be logical. It's here that the rumors are passed around. I've never heard them in the far north where I was last year. I've never heard them in the far east either. This talk of treasure in a city, I hear it here and within a hundred or so miles of here. Still, Maddie said, there are at least three ancient cities within a hundred miles of here. But only one great ancient city, said Casper. That's the one we're going to. A city is big, Lena said, remembering the myriad of streets and buildings of Ember. How will you know where in the city to look for the treasure? A crafty look came over Casper's face. He smiled, with his lips pressed together and his eyes narrowed. That's where my careful study comes in, he said. Many, many hours of study. I've written down every version of the rhyme I've heard, which is a great many, 47 to be exact. I've compared them word for word, letter for letter. Then, Casper paused. He looked at them in a way Lena recognized. It was the same way Torin looked when he was about to make a big impression. Then, I applied my skill with numbers. Numbers, said Lena. That's right. What you do is you count the letters and the words. You count it in all the different ways until you see a pattern. The pattern is the key to the code and the code tells you the secret of the message. He sat back looking highly pleased with himself. And the secret of the message, Lena said confused. Is the location of the treasure, of course. Casper slapped a hand on his big thigh. It's obvious once you figured it out. Street numbers, building numbers, it's all there. Well then, said Maddie, what is the location of the treasure? Casper jerked his head back. You think I'd tell you? He asked. I thought I was your partner in this, said Maddie. You'll know when it's time, said Casper. Until then, the information stays strictly with me. Lena glanced at Maddie in time to see her rolling her eyes toward the sky. That night, Lena couldn't sleep. Animal sounds kept her awake, scrambling and snuffling just beyond the walls, and a strange hooting in the distance. Dark thoughts troubled her, too. Casper's search sounded all wrong somehow. She didn't want to help him. The thought of it filled her with dread. She lay on the hard floor of the house, staring at the black sky, feeling worse and worse, until finally she decided she must try to think about something else. So she said to herself over and over for a long time, tomorrow I'll see the city, tomorrow I'll see the city. They traveled the next day, mile after mile, along a road that was nearly straight, though they had to trace a winding path around the places where the pavement was pitted or thrust up and crumbled away. On their right was a vast green sheet of water bordered by waving grasses where great white birds stood knee-deep in pools and rose like floating paper and flocks of black birds flew up trilling into the air their shoulders red as blood on the left was a forest of trees so thick they hid all but the briefest glimpses of the ruined buildings among them lena's excitement was rising she rode standing up now she had climbed back into the crate and stuck her feet between the third and fourth slats of the side, which put her at the right height for holding on to the top edge and looking forward. She could see over Casper's and Maddie's heads to the rear ends of the oxen, their sharp hip bones sticking up, left, right, left, right, their tasseled tails switching back and forth. The sun sank lower in the sky until it was directly ahead, blazing straight into Lena's eyes. We'll be there before night, Casper said. The road began to slope upward. Hills rose on either side, and soon Lena could no longer see the water. Just the brown humps of the hills spotted with clumps of trees and scarred here and there by the remains of old roads and buildings. The air was cooler. They rounded a curve, 
and all at once the city lay before them.